ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. We're going to start momentarily here. Welcome to New America. Um, we're here on the 16th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to um, kind of describe where we are and where we might be going. Uh, we have an absolutely outstanding uh, group of panelists. Uh, David Gartenstein Ross, who is at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, who's uh, written multiple books uh, related to jihadism um, and is one of the leading figures in the field. Josh Geltzer, to his right, your left. Uh, Josh was a senior director of counterterrorism at the National Security Council. Uh, before that, he worked at the Department of Justice in a senior position in the National Security Division. Uh, he has also uh, actually written a book about Al Qaeda, which uh, was the fruit of his uh, DPhil at uh, King's College in London. Uh, and to his right and to your left, Nadia Wadat, who has a DPhil in Oriental Studies from Oxford, who is a fellow at New America, as is Josh, <coughs> and uh, is writing a book about uh, kind of essentially the the alternative voices to Arab, uh, Arab vo uh, the alternative voices to ISIS in the Arab world, whether they're secular, liberal comedic or any other flavor. Uh, so we're, we're going to start uh, with, uh, with, with Josh uh, reflecting a little bit about continuity and change between the Obama and Trump administration. Uh, then Nadia is going to talk a little bit about what she's seeing in the Arab world. Then David is going to uh, uh, talk, uh, try and uh, meld the domestic and the international uh, discussion. Um, I may say a couple of things as well. Um, this has been carried by C-SPAN Live. Uh, so when we come to the Q&A, uh, please wait for the mic so your question can be heard not only in this room but also by the audience. And thank you for coming today. Yeah, wherever you're comfortable. Yeah, sure. <coughs> uh, thanks very much, uh, Peter. Thank you for uh, having me. This is truly a, uh, uh, at least in my view, a dream team to be uh, part of for this discussion, and obviously a meaningful day to do it uh, as we talk about important policy issues. It's also a day to reflect on kind of the, the emotional elements of terrorism and counterterrorism, and so I'm grateful for, for the chance to be part of this, uh, this discussion. Um, as, as you indicated, I thought I might uh, set the table a little bit with a few elements uh, of continuity between how, uh, in my view, the last uh, administration, in some cases the last couple of administrations, approached counterterrorism and how the current administration is approaching it, and then uh, offer a few elements that strike me as um, elements of change. Uh, when it comes to uh, continuity, perhaps uh, at the top of the list is the critical campaign to take back physical territory from ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. If ISIS is the uh, preeminent terrorist uh, threat of the moment at least, uh, uh, depriving that group of, of safe haven, of fighters, of numbers, strikes me as critical and uh, I see a lot of continuity in how this administration is approaching that. There was a basic campaign plan drawn up really a couple of years ago at this point. It involved Mosul, which has now been uh, largely cleared of ISIS. Uh, involved uh, clearing Raqqa of ISIS, which is underway. Uh, it involved a push into the Euphrates River Valley and continuing work that needs to be done there. But in terms of the amount of territory the group controls and the way uh, that number is being shrunk over time and the pressure uh, that's being applied to the group along the way, I see a lot of continuity in that. And that strikes me as largely a, a good thing. Um, a second element of continuity, speaking more broadly here, is a basic sense of where terrorist threats to the United States come from in this world and how to prioritize among them. One could have imagined uh, a new administration, especially one that in some ways um, branded itself as being different in many respects, including national security elements from its predecessor, coming in and seeing things quite differently. Uh, one never knew exactly what America first meant for counterterrorism, but one could see looking at places like Somalia and al-Shabaab, looking at places uh, like uh, uh, Yemen and uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, as well as, as ISIS, which is active in both those places, and either seeing the threat as much more severe, such that the U.S. might want to dramatically increase its involvement, or as not really a problem uh, worth the United States dealing with. And neither has happened. Instead, there's been some recalibration of authorities and policy approvals. But fundamentally, wh what I see about eight months in is largely an acceptance of 
where the threats are and how to rank them from a US uh, perspective. Um, and finally, a, a third element of continuity is the idea that often, not always, but often, US counterterrorism is going to be a partner-driven affair. I think this is something the Bush administration and the Obama administration came to and increasingly emphasized over time, that there will always be um, some threats so imminent, so dire, that the US needs to act itself against them. But that dealing with the range of threats in all their varied form and all the geographies in which they're cropping up is simply too much to do alone. And so in various ways, through training, through funding, through actual military partnerships, through other forms like intel sharing, there would need to be a reliance on and at times a building up of partners. And again, eight months in, there's a recalibration uh, on the margins of maybe which partners where, but that seems to be another element of continuity. Let me say three things that seem to me different, and I'll preview by saying I, I find the, the difference a little bit concerning on, on all three, and maybe we can get into why. One is uh, the ideological dimension, especially of the counter-ISIS fight, but of, of this, uh, the counter-terrorism uh, effort more broadly, uh, which is somewhat ironic for a, a new administration that uh, some of whose voices came in criticizing the Obama and the Bush teams for dealing with only the surface problem and not getting at the ideological roots, as, and this is their words, uh, of, this, uh, of this problem, it seems to me there's actually been a stepping back, and in particular from some of the structures that were built, specifically to deal with the ideological dimension. So domestically, you had the relatively new Countering Violent Extremism Task Force. Um, focused overseas, you had the State Department's Global Engagement Center. And what you've seen is um, key leadership leaving those places. You've seen a, a hesitation to accept and use funds already allocated uh, in the task force's case for certain grants focused on right-wing uh, extremism, which uh, looks even more concerning to me after the events of Charlottesville, uh, for the GEC, an initial disinclination to take money already offered by Congress. That seems to be changing, although there's been a limit to how much is being asked of the Defense Department, which is something else Congress allowed for. And to roll back the very structures built to get at that part of the problem strikes me as, um, as concerning. Uh, a second element, and this is in a sense ideological, but more about us uh, uh, than, than about uh, external actors, is the idea of resilience in the US public and politics and society. I think, again, from the Bush administration into the Obama administration, there was an effort, increasing over time, to take seriously the very real fear that terrorism generates. But at the same time, to try to cultivate, inculcate a certain uh, ability not to let that fear drive policy and to minimize how much that, uh, that fear spreads. And um, to me, at least, one of the more surprising, befuddling new elements is almost a 180 on that. And of course, we saw the president criticizing the, the mayor of London uh, for trying to reassure the, the public there after an attack uh, and seeming to stoke um, uh, fear uh, rather than build resilience. And it seems to me Whatever one's view of counterterrorism strategy, if you're doing what your adversary wants you to do, you may need to rethink what you're doing. And that seems to me to be one element uh, that's new and concerning here. And uh, one more um, uh, element of, of some change, though I'm not sure it should be called change yet, I think we're in kind of a, a watch and see, is how quickly, how aggressively, and just how uh, the United States is approaching Al-Qaeda in Syria. I mentioned before that ISIS may be today's preeminent terrorist threat, but Al-Qaeda in Syria is worrisome. It is Al-Qaeda's largest global affiliate at this point. It has key figures. And in the last administration, there was an escalating effort to take on that challenge, take on that threat. Um, perhaps most notably on the president's last full day in office, actually. I think it was Thursday, January 19. Mm -hmm. There was a sizable strike against about 100 uh, Al-Qaeda in Syria uh, figures. And that was kind of a, 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 a trend line that seemed to be going in one direction. There was a notable strike in mid-February against a key uh, Al-Qaeda in Syria uh, leader. But as reports come out of Al-Qaeda in Syria consolidating its control in Idlib province, eliminating some of the other uh, extremist groups, either by um, getting them off the battlefield or absorbing them, and with discussion of um, a de-escalation de zone there, De-escalation overall seems a very good thing given the humanitarian catastrophe that continues to unfold. But what all of that means for getting at a group that seems to me to be exercising both tactical and strategic patience and how they're uh, approaching 
um, themselves and the Syrian context in which they find themselves, uh, I worry uh, about anything other than a increasing focus and perhaps an increasing aggressiveness to disrupt that group. So let me pause there. Well, thank you, <coughs> Josh. Um, brilliant summation. Uh, Nadia. <coughs> came back from uh, three months in the Middle East doing field research for my book that Peter mentioned. So it, it's really troubling in the region as your comprehensive paper talks about the Sunni-Shia rivalry. And it is troubling beyond any words can describe because it, it has direct relations to the war on terrorism because terrorists happen to be Sunni extremists. And a lot of Sunni governments are more than happy to turn the other side when these militants serve Sunni agenda, including on the borders, including uh, ideologically. In Saudi, for example, a uh, Al Qarni, one of the most popular Twitter stars, uh, Wahhabi stars, pro jihad in Syria, just got detained. But it's not for. Uh, urging young people to go to war in Syria. It's for being a sympathizer with Qatar. So mm -hmm. you could perpetuate all the hate you want. You could urge people to go kill other Muslims, but uh, if, and, and you have complete freedom. But if you sympathize, and this is actually really significant because it shows uh, people who can actually take on terrorism are not only uh, have adversarial uh, powers in government, in these Sunni governments, but also even companies like Google and Facebook, unfortunately, are shutting down their accounts because they are secular and they're offending, essentially, the Talibans of these countries. So they are facing it from both ends. And unfortunately, this is the best hope for really winning the war. Uh, this is a war of, of ideas, essentially. It's, it cannot be won militarily. Yes, ISIS had a lot of weapons, a lot of training when they were on one side or another, but it's ideological at the end of the day. What all of these terrorists have in common is that ideology, which we have not done anything to counter. Uh, our allies, while they say that they are our allies, do not take down the accounts of these people that have sometimes followings in the millions uh, that perpetuate these ideas. So the war of ideas is still, we haven't yet fought that idea. We haven't yet really taken on uh, or confront our allies and say, you have to stop this stream of ideological uh, river of hate that is destabilizing the entire world. Security has become a concern all over Europe. Even though it's really the greatest casualty is people in the Middle East, millions have, their lives have been wrecked, not to mention the victims. So I'm going to keep it here and then. Um, address questions later. David. So <coughs> if it were 16 years ago and uh, your friend had a crystal ball, uh, they might tell you that in 2017 we would have experienced um, a number of rapid victories against the jihadist movement. You would, of course, see that as a good thing. Um, then when you hear what those victories are, your view might change. We took Mosul back from the jihadists. We took Raqqa back from the jihadists, and we're about to launch a major offensive in the Euphrates River Valley to take back more territory that they control. Right? It would be obvious that something has gone wrong. Um, I uh, strongly agree with, both, uh, with what the other panelists said, that this is a great panel. It's really an honor to be here with, um, with Peter, with Josh, and with Nadia, all of whom I, I respect greatly. Um, I think that uh, there's, there's two things I want to talk about. One is the posture of Al-Qaeda which is something I've spilled a lot of ink over over the past uh, several years. And the other is, why is it that we get this problem wrong? Right? Why is it that we appear to be moving backwards? With respect to Al-Qaeda itself, this is an organization whose obituary has been written um, a, a large number of times, um, more times even than the various um, fighters who keep uh, showing up uh, alive and then dead, the Mokhtar, Bel Mokhtars and the like. The organization itself seems to have you know, more lives than a cat. Um, within the past six years, originally the um, Arab uprisings were supposed to be uh, the end of jihadism by discrediting its narrative. 
then ISIS was supposed to be the end of Al-Qaeda. ISIS had come along, um, according to uh, a lot of views of the topic, it had displaced Al-Qaeda as the premier jihadist organization. It was certainly aggressively trying to peel off um, Al-Qaeda branches, and succeeded in a few cases, Ansar Bayt al-Maqdis in uh, Egypt, and Boko Haram, which was an undeclared Al-Qaeda affiliate, did go over. Um, but I think Al-Qaeda has emerged from both of these as a much stronger organization than it was uh, in 2010. Um, on the one hand, it skillfully played itself off of ISIS to uh, portray its organization as being the moderate jihadists, people who you might not like but you can do business with. And really, the uh, degree to which you can operate openly, and I'm certain, Nadia, that you saw this in the region, it's shocking compared to what we would have expected five years ago, four years ago. Um, in Jordan, uh, you have figures like Abu Muhammad al-Makdisi and Abu Qatada, major al-Qaeda ideologues who've been released from prison in part because they're anti-ISIS. Not just released from prison, but also able to appear on television. Um, and the Jordanians are, are no dummies, right? To them, they consider ISIS to be the more important threat. And so uh, they're doing you know, part of what the, the Hashemite kingdom has always done, which is you know, playing things to, get, to muddle through in the immediate term, mm. and then they'll deal with the longer term consequences when they get there. But on, on Al-Qaeda's part, being more restrained than ISIS has been very helpful. And they've, um, in their propaganda, very explicitly said, you know, one of the advantages of ISIS's rise is now everyone knows who the true Khawarij are. You know, a derogatory name referring to an early Islamic sect that is universally despised as being too extreme. Um, then the second thing they've played off of is what Nadia talked about, the Sunni-Shia competition, where uh, Al-Qaeda is, in some cases, uh, the de facto ally of the Sunni GCC states. That's clearly the case in Syria, where um, you know, Al-Qaeda's branch uh, now known as Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, but it's gone through a couple of name changes recently, um, had gotten state support. This is in the open. You know, it's been discussed in multiple sources. Uh, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia have provided support to that organization. Um, Al-Qaeda leaders uh, mm -hmm. now have uh, de facto uh, safe haven in parts of Turkey. Uh, Joby Warwick wrote about this in the Washington Post uh, in July of last year with major figures being able to transit between Syria and Turkey and operate openly in Istanbul. Uh, in Yemen, uh, Al-Qaeda's branch has become uh, a de facto ground force for the GCC uh, offensive to push back um, the um, uh, Iranian-backed faction there. You know, all of this is, is very bad news. I don't think we've really thought through how difficult it's going to be to disentangle Al-Qaeda's new ability to operate openly. Uh, the Abbottabad documents that were recovered from bin Laden's compound talk very clearly about how bin Laden saw that in the wake of AQ's defeat in Iraq, they had a real branding problem. He wanted to change the way that they were perceived. And I think that between 2011 and now, they have done so within the region. So why do we get these things wrong? Uh, I think one answer is just is misperceptions on our part. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, our own policies have, of course, at times made this problem worse as opposed to better. Um, I, I would say that two of our foreign misadventures have been a real problem, the Iraq War and the Libya War. In both of those, I think that um, there were clear misperceptions on our part. Uh, for Iraq, you know, the, the uh, assessment about Iraqi WMDs is very well known. Um, I think in Libya, uh, we've put less attention on our own misperceptions that helped to contribute to that conflict. Um, specifically, I think that if we'd appreciated the degree to which jihadism was going to be able to benefit from the Arab uprisings, we would have been far more hesitant to go to war in a country that stood in the middle of two others who had just experienced revolutions. I think there's no question that the uh, fall of the Qaddafi regime has made things harder for Tunisia. Um, both of the major terrorist attacks that occurred there in 2015 
uh, had their origins in Sabratha, Libya. It's made things harder for Egypt. It contributed directly to uh, the fall of northern Mali uh, to an al-Qaeda branch. Um, obviously, they're, they no longer control it, but you currently have an insurgency rage, raging there. Um, the second thing I'd say is technology. Um, you know, so ISIS's use of social media is well known. We can see how ISIS has deployed drones in uh, its fight to hold its territory in Iraq. You know, technology is sometimes ambiguous when it comes to the jostling between state and non-state actors. Um, you know, one uh, really good study uh, done a few years ago by Jacob Shapiro and Niels Weidman uh, talks about how in Iraq, during the course of the Iraqi insurgency, um, if you look at the placement of cell phone towers and the incidence of insurgent violence, it was very clear that cell phone towers decreased insurgent violence. It's because they increased the flow of information from people to counterinsurgent forces. That's an example of technology helping to counterinsurgents. It seems to me that very definitively, the pendulum has swung in the other direction. And for the past few years, violent non-state actors have been benefiting from technology rather than being hurt by this. We can see this in one of the things that's made ISIS's attacks on the West so much more um, frequent and so much more deadly. It's a model that I refer to as the virtual planner model. Others have a different name for it. But it was basically ISIS taking advantage of two converging trends, social media and their ability to reach out and talk to operatives much more easily, and end-to-end -end encryption, the ability to make those communications invisible to government forces trying to surveil them. Uh, virtual planners have been able to fill in and do all the things that physical terrorist networks once did. Scouting for operatives, um, encouraging them to take action, helping them to conceptualize the timing of an attack and the target, providing technical assistance, bomb making skills, for example, where it's much more effective than you know, the old terrorist manuals to talk with an operative, get on an encrypted video chat, and have them walk you through how you can build a bomb. Uh, in some cases, the virtual planner is with the operative right until the moment that they detonate themselves. That was the case in a suicide attack that occurred in Ansbach, Germany last year, where um, the Germans released this chat transcript where the operative was getting cold feet. He was supposed to carry out a suicide bombing at a concert and saw that there was security there. And so he's saying to his virtual planner, like, there's guards there, I can't go in. And the virtual planner says, look, forget about the concert, you go to a restaurant. And the operative says, pray for me, brother. You have no idea what's going on right now. The virtual planner says, hey, man, what's going on with you? Even if I could kill just two people, I would do it. Forget about the concert. Trust in God and go to the restaurant. And that's just what the operative did. Had the virtual planner not been there, um, from reading that chat transcript, I have no doubt that he would not have followed through. Having someone there to chat with up until the very moment of detonation helped him to carry it out. Um, so technology has been a factor, but then the final thing I'll point to quickly is you know, one analogy I use a lot to describe our conflict with these violent non-state actors is uh, startup firms against legacy industries. Uh, to me, if you look at that competition in the economic sphere, in many ways, violent non-state actors are the startup organizations of the political organizing space. And um, they're able to, like startups, be debureaucratized, shift their strategy very quickly, and incorporate the latest technology into their plans, while governments often look like legacy firms, too bureaucratized, uh, too slow moving, uh, often unable to even recognize the strategy that their competitors are undertaking. I think part of you know, the future of this competition is us thinking more about the design of our own government and the way we approach these questions and having something that is better suited internally to 21st century competitions. Uh, David, you said the non-state actors. I actually think it'd be a lot easier to understand what is happening in the Middle East if we think of these terrorist groups as state militias. These are if these GCC countries decide to really cut the supplies in ideology and platform, you can be killed for mocking the ISIS god, as happened with Nahid Hattar in Jordan, or 
tweeting one liberal sentence against religious extremism and end up uh, jailed. But you can preach jihadism for years on end on TV without any problem. So these are very much state militias, state actors. They are not non-state actors. I, I don't disagree about the intersection of the state. Um, as you know, I'm very much on the same page with you in terms of what you outlined in, in how um, the constructs of the legal system and mores feed into these groups. I definitely do call them non-state actors, though, in the sense that we can see what's happening in the Middle East is actually paralleled in other areas, and not just in the sphere of jihadism. In Latin America, you know, um, I think it's no exaggeration to say that MS-13 poses an existential threat to El Salvador and Honduras. When you look at Mexican cartels, they've been able to adapt quickly um, the way that, that major transnational businesses do. And if you look at the uptick in violence in Mexico, where over 80,000 people have been killed since 2006, you can see the damage that's been done there. So the intersection of the state, I absolutely agree. But I also think that looking uh, across non-state actors, well, there's commonalities. Let me, let me ask both of you and Josh, because I mean, this is actually a rather important point. So there's, you used the word state support when you talked about um, al-Qaeda in Syria. And you said the state support came from Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Qatar. Now, is it, in fact, something a little bit more complicated and, uh, and has become more complicated over time, which is initially perhaps acquiescence, state acquiescence, uh, and now, you know, a uh, fairly active, I mean, gutter has sort of been put on notice and has, has I think, tried to clean its act up. Uh, Turkey, Arabia, uh, certainly the idea that the Saudi government is supporting al-Qaeda in, in Syria wouldn't, doesn't make a lot of common sense. I mean, after all, al-Qaeda's principal goal is the overthrow of the Saudi government. So let's, let's try and drill down on that before we move on, because I think it's an important question, and not one where we're going to settle very easily on this stage, because it's complicated. But it, state support seems overdrawn. What I mean, though, the <laughs> Shia threat is, yeah. is seen as existential in yeah. GCC countries. It, it is, and in Yemen, it is seen as Shia Sunni conflict. Is it in, seen as the Shia Syria, threat or the Iran threat, or both? I mean, they, I don't think there's much distinction, honestly. Mm. At least in the, in the media, in uh, the mouthpieces of these Gulf states, which dominate the Middle East. So yeah. I'm not sure there is, I mean. So Josh, you were in charge of this effort for the US government uh -huh. until relatively recently. So what's your view? Well, uh, in some ways, as, as, as David mentioned, threat uh, misperceptions, or broader misperceptions, when it came to Iraq and, and Libya, and the in particular, terrorist problems that flowed from those. Um, I do wonder if, if Syria deserves to be in, in that bucket too, right? You had um, countries uh, that perhaps should be considered to include our own that looked at um, what was breaking out there as something that with maybe not a little push, that might be a bit of a character, but with some element of a push could lead to the ouster of uh, Assad, who I, I think should be universally accepted as, as a terrible uh, and brutal person. Uh, and in fact, whatever that assessment relied on, uh, it didn't prove quite so easy. Mm -hmm. And from a counter-terrorist perspective, what flowed, and probably from a humanitarian perspective, what flowed of this just persistent safe haven for the terrorist groups, recruitment capacity for the terrorist groups, and just humanitarian disaster after humanitarian disaster on that side of things, m may be uh, in some ways the worst of all possible worlds especially if we don't know the way out from it. And so um, I, I think that does lead countries to be viewing the actors there differently now from how they may have viewed things a few years ago. But it leaves things in, I admit, a, a, a worrisome place. And, and, and I would stick by my statement that they mm -hmm. have received state support. I mean, as, as all of you know, uh, one way that al-Qaeda fought in Syria uh, was through coalitions. And, um, you know, all of you, of course, are familiar with the ways that al-Qaeda was funded prior to 9-11 attacks. They were anti-Saudi then, and they got a great deal of support from some Saudi organizations that were quasi-governmental. You used to work, work for one of them. Um, Al-Haramain was one example of that. And um, you know, did they get state support pre-9-11? I think the answer, ultimately, if you break down the way the state functions, is yes, mm -hmm. though there were degrees of vagary and deniability built in. I think in Syria, it's less vague. Um, I think that it went to the um, to umbrella organizations that were dominated by Jabhat al-Nusra, 
um, and you know that that these states knew what was happening. Now, but, but as Joff is indicating, the context was sort of changed. So early in the war against, I mean, I mean, the, the description you've just made seems very true several years ago. Is it true today? It's not true in the same way today. Yeah. I mean, like, so what's I, I, changed? Well, I believe that the words I used were that they have received state support. Yeah. That that there was actually it was carefully worded. Um, I think that today there's a question mark. Um, I think for some it's less so, but you know, in Turkey, AQ figures definitely. I, I haven't seen any evidence that they're less able to operate in Turkey, and in fact, the evidence seems to su to suggest that the opposite is happening. Mm. They're more able to operate openly. Um, for Qatar, I mean, if you look at the designation of Mohammed Al Noemi, right? Um, it's it's very specific as to what he was channeling money to, for and he's still an advisor to the. For those who don't know him, who who is he? Um, Mohammed Al Noemi is a uh, designated uh, financier who's um, been an insider within the Qatar royal family for quite some time. He serves as an advisor. Uh, at times, he had ministerial posts. At times, he's been out of favor. At one point, he was jailed, but now he seems to. Um, again, be an advisor from what we can tell, given the opacity uh, within Qatari society. And all of that indicates to me that, look, if, for figures who are ideologically committed to supporting jihadism, um, it's not so much of um, them doing like a Team America and saying, Durka, Durka, Muhammad Jihad, but rather if you could, you have seen him, Team America? Okay. So, um, but instead, you can frame these things in terms of national interest, right? Mm -hmm. That we, have a national interest you know, for Qatar or Saudi Arabia in making sure that Iran doesn't dominate Syria, as indeed it's coming to do. Yeah. And so these groups may not like them, but we should channel support there. Yeah. And so, one, so it might be for a different reason depending on who's undertaking the policy, but we can see the policies. But I think that's a very helpful distinction for the people in, uh, in the room and also the audience, which is because when you say they're state supporting Al-Qaeda, we have a certain vision of what that right. is, means. But what, the, what, what you're saying is they're supporting groups that uh, happen to be in the Al-Qaeda uh, ecosystem that um, you know, we're trying to get rid of Assad, which after all, so yeah. were we. Uh, I mean, it, I think it, 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 it kind of helps kind of clarify a little bit better. Oh, no, I, I agree 100% there, yeah. that, that one should understand what that means contextually, yeah. but it's still a problem. And that's where what Nadia says I think is very important, that the regional context um, and the way in which things like blasphemy laws tend to mm -hmm. favor um, people who want to support these groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that's a real problem that, that Nadia is right. We don't address that enough. I think we're very timid in talking about that. I'd like to drill down on that, but just before that, uh, sort of zoom out a little bit and go back to David's crystal ball and say, here's another version of the crystal ball. If you had been looking at the crystal ball in 2002 yeah. and said, there would be no attack on the United States by a foreign terrorist organization in the next 16 years that succeeded, and that 95 Americans would have been killed by jihadist terrorists on average, you know, six a year. That would have seemed like a totally absurd, uh, optimistic uh, prediction. But that is actually what has happened. And there's a whole range of reasons for that, including the work of many people in this room, which is our defensive capabilities, our offensive capabilities, and the, the fact that public the public is attuned to this as an issue. Um, and so without getting into more details, uh, we have put up a pretty strong defense and um, uh, the terrorists have, have not succeeded, which isn't to say that they couldn't. But so that brings you to the question of what is the threat? And there's been a lot of <coughs> sort of vaporization on this question uh, by various <laughs> people. Some of them used to work in the Trump administration and now don't. But the threat is clearly a homegrown threat. And uh, New, New America releases a paper today based on a kind of fairly comprehensive look at, at the data uh, that was written by David Sherman, uh, Albert Ford, Lisa Sims, and myself with an assist from Chris Mellon. Um, and the data is, is very clear. Uh, the, every lethal attack in the United States since 9-11 has been carried out by an American or a legal permanent resident. Uh, more than half of these uh, folks, uh, if you look at the 413 cases of jihadist terrorism since 9-11, more than half of the, the people, the perpetrators, were in, born in the United States. Refugees are basically a totally non, they're a non-issue. There are 12 refugees in the data set, uh, many of them uh, you know, accused of relatively trivial crimes in the grand scheme of things compared to you know, tr uh, carrying out a plot. And also, these, these things happened a long time ago. Um, and so you're looking at a very American problem and you're looking at a very internet-based problem. 
And the, uh, so, for instance, of the 129 people that we found on the public record who traveled to Syria, attempted to travel to Syria, or helped others who were trying to do so, 129 uh, militants, 101 were very active online, not mean, meaning not just sending emails, but downloading jihadist material, swapping jihadist material, uh, in some cases, uh, as David has laid out, communicating with uh, virtual recruiters in Syria and Iraq and uh, people within ISIS. Uh, so this is a very internet-based phenomenon. Of the 129 cases, we found no cases of in-person recruitment, no radical clerics, no, no attendance at a mosque where suddenly uh, the, you know, you're brought into a plot. No, so a lot of the old ideas about recruitment, uh, in-person recruitment, are, are, not, don't, are not matched by the data. Now, the situation in Europe is, and there's a reason, therefore, that the attacks in the United States that we are seeing are people like Omar Mateen, who was born in Queens, New York, not far from where our president was born, who was also born in Queens, New York. So a very American person. Um, you know, or Major Nadal Hassan, who was born not far from where we're talking, in Arlington, Virginia, who was a major in the U.S. military, a psychiatrist. It doesn't get any more kind of part of the American story. Uh, and luckily, because of geography, we, you can drive from Paris to Damascus. You can't drive from Washington to Damascus. Where, you know, the United States is insulated from these ideas for two big reasons. One is physical, and one is metaphysical. The physical is geogra geography, that we're separated by two big oceans. Uh, but secondarily, the American dream has worked very well for American Muslims, as it's worked for every other uh, generation of American immigrants. American Muslims are on average as well educated as the average American. They're on average have the same incomes. They don't live in ghettos, except with one, one exception, which is the very disadvantaged Somali American population in Minneapolis, who lives in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the United States, the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. But this is the exception that proves the rule. So everything I've just said you can reverse in Europe, where most a lot of European Muslims do live in ghettos. They are discriminated against. You're two and a half times less likely to be asked back to a job interview with the same qualifications if you have a Muslim name as opposed to a Christian-sounding uh, name. Um, it is not an accident that every single one of the Brussels and Paris attackers have been through the effectively universities of jihad that are the Belgian and, prison, uh, Belgian and French uh, prison system. 8% of the French population is Muslim. 60%, an estimated 60% of their prison population is Muslim. An enormously kind of uh, uh, helpful fact to, to understand how discriminated and uh, against this, this group is in, in countries like, like France and Belgium. So we have a very different situation here. Um, and it, so it, it's not only the, our defenses, but also our, our ideolo ideology has allowed us to accept uh, Muslim immigrants in a way that makes them part of society rather than not part of society. But so, and that's all the good news. But the bad news is, is the following. Um, as, I mean, I was part of one of the people who was writing Al-Qaeda's obituary. Uh, in fact, Wolf Blitzer leaned over to me as, uh, just after bin Laden, you know, President Obama, 12-minute speech, Will Blitzer says, well, what do you think? And I, like, you don't have to, you have no time to prepare. And I said, well, the war on terror is over. When I didn't mean terrorism was over, but I meant the war on terror as the organizing principle of American national security, surely with this death, and also the destruction of almost all the leaders of Al-Qaeda Central, and the Arab Spring in which Al-Qaeda's ideas and personnel were totally absent, that surely this would be it for this, and that terrorism would become a second order problem. I was completely and utterly wrong. And since we're with here with a bunch of very smart people in the room and, and also uh, listening to this on, on C-SPAN, I'm going to make a political science observation, because we, which is uh, Hobbes wrote Leviathan in 1651. And, and what, what's the, uh, as the English Civil War was winding down, and why did he write it? He wrote it because he just saw the catastrophe the English Civil War had inflicted on his country. And what did he say? The, so what he said essentially was the only thing worse than a dictator is anarchy. And this is why what the first thing we need is order. So we ran a huge political science experiment in Iraq in 2003 and decapitated the state and, and, and the army <laughs> with the result that anybody knows what happened. And then we did the same thing in Libya. It's like we didn't even pay attention. And we made, and as I think Josh has sort of explained, we the United States makes sins of omission and commission. So we, we made sins of commission with Libya and Iraq, and then we made a sin of omission because the situation in Iraq, surely if we'd intervened in some way earlier, w which would have had its own problems, <laughs> could it have been any worse than what we see? So, but that raises then the question of where do we go from, from here? And, and I think, you know, one point I think is very important. To, we, we've all said, look, Al-Qaeda is doing pretty well. What does that mean for American national security? What does it mean for Europe? What does it mean for the Middle East? Because I think it's important to rank these issues. 
Um, so we, the United States, are insulated from this for the reasons I've already laid out. And here's the evidence for that as opposed to the, the assertions. Seven American militants who've been trained in Iraq and Syria have returned to the United States, as far as we can tell from the public records. There may be one or two of those sort of we don't know about. The French uh, Interior Ministry said publicly in July that 271 French militants have returned. And believe me, the French do not have really a good capacity, as we now know, to track all these folks. And that, and the front, that front, and obviously, when you've had 7,000 Europeans go, go um, you know, France is just one country of, of, of a couple of dozen in Europe who are facing this problem. So the problem in Europe is much more profound. And what we don't know what's going to follow ISIS, but we can almost guarantee whether it's Al-Qaeda merging with a rump ISIS, bits of Al-Qaeda and ISIS merging, a son of ISIS, whatever, we're, there are going to be other iterations of this. And, and that is because there are nine big drivers. There is the regional civil war between the Sunni and Shia that, uh, uh, that Nadia referred to. There is um, obviously the social media uh, uh, that, uh, that amplifies all the negative trends. There is a collapse of Arab governments in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen. There is the collapse of the Arab economy. There is the massive population bulge in the Arab world. Uh, the Arab and North Africa regions are the fastest growing regions in the world other than the sub-Saharan Africa. Their populations will double in the next 50 years. Then there is the massive wave of Muslim immigration into Europe, which does not have the capacity to take, uh, it, the, the most importantly, the ideological capacity to make these people French. There, there is no French dream, German dream, EU dream. Um, and then there's the rise of ultra-nationalist European parties, parties that are going to increase the alienation of Muslims in Europe because they're basically anti-immigrant parties, and very strongly so. And these were, you know, in Hungary and Poland and France and, and Britain, these were very, and France, uh, uh, these were all very marginal parties. But now they are key players, if not they're actually running the government. Uh, and so if you accept that all these big drivers are going to be out there, because ISIS is a European phenomenon and a Middle Eastern phenomenon. It's not an American phenomenon in quite the same, uh, you know, to, to any meaningful degree. If you accept that these drivers are out there, then you kind of come to a rather pessimistic, non-obituary uh, kind of writing uh, prediction, which is we're going to have this problem for a long time. But at the end of the day, it's a big problem for the Middle East, and it's a medium-sized problem for, for Europe, and it's a relatively small problem for the domestic United States, except insofar as we are the leader of the free world. And it is our responsibility to kind of try and get our hands around this, and I think this is a good segue to the question of how do we win the ideological war because it not, uh, Nadia has raised it. And I, you know, we hear a lot of this as like we've got to win the ideological war, but, which is a really easy thing to say, but it turns into to be just a slogan. Because like how do you actually operationalize that? And I'd like to get your opinion, all, all three panelists, about the GEC at the State Department, which I think did have a kind of pretty good answer to this, uh, what, you, what Google and Jigsaw are doing, and if you can reflect uh, you know, the government and the social media companies, I think, have done, in my view, a relatively good job in the last three years. And, you know, Josh, you led the effort on the government side. Uh, you know, you, you've helped Google, I, I think, you know, to think through some of these issues. David has been writing about it. So let's start with this question, because in a way it's the hardest question, which is ha what has been done, what is working, what is not working, what could be done, and is this a fool's errand anyway? Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, there doesn't seem to be that I can really uh, see an import a discernment of just how important the virtual space is. It is real. It is as important as the physical space anymore. So if we have thousands of uh, jihadi moth pieces, that is troubling. That is as good as having them physically. So this really needs to be addressed. So even though this is not an American problem, be because this is really a Middle East generated problem, a GCC generated problem, in fact, at its inception point. GCC, for people who don't know, is what? Uh, Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Emirates. So, um, um, Qatar. So uh, even though this is not an American problem, per se, but it is American platforms that are being used to either help jihadists or help liberals, people who actually espouse liberal ideas like freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I did, as you mentioned, um, help with a Google uh, project. And Google, I know a lot of these companies have very good intentions. And are, their, are their say, focus are, are is- Are you able to say more detail what you did for Google? I, uh, what I can say is Google is targeting the people that 
are interested in going to um, join jihad and exposing them to an alternative view, maybe pictures from, or people who have, are returning or barely escaped with their lives after joining the Islamic State or to see what it's really like, that it's not a, an Islamic haven, it's actually a very authoritarian, brutal, you, you'll, have, you'll be enslaved essentially. So just put an alternative uh, story right next to somebody who's interested in going to jihad in Syria, literally Googling, going to jihad in Syria. Or, so, but the thing is, before it gets there, there is a huge lack of context. There's a huge lack of understanding and the nuances. Because somebody, for example, who uh, preaches freedom of conscience, there may not be a discernment that there's a, there's a direct relationship between having freedom of conscience. We here in America, you, what you believe is your business, what I believe is my business, it's very personal. Not in Muslim countries. And there is a direct relation. If, if you want to counter ISIS, you have to allow freedom of conscience in Muslim countries. Because if, if the thesis that we as Muslims have the right to force our Islam, regardless if it's Shia, Sunni, whatever, that one that has power on the rest of humanity, that is very troublesome. And that thesis has not been even, nobody really has challenged it in the Muslim world. And it has to be done in the Muslim world. And it is being done in the Muslim world by a lot of educated people. But they are being silenced either by authoritarian states or sometimes their profiles are being shut down because they are offensive to Taliban-like figures in the Arab countries. So there has to be a discernment that the values that make America and Europe a beacon for freedom of thought and expression, the very same values need to be applied to everybody who uses the internet, whether it's in the Middle East, in Muslim countries, or America. There shouldn't be two standards. So there was a scandal about Facebook helping the government identify blasphemy. Uh, blasphemous people. I mean, in which, we which would country? Pakistan. So should Facebook or YouTube or uh, really help these governments crack down on people who don't want to believe in uh, jihadism or as they see it? Or so, American companies need to actually be. They, they are already part of this war. They can't say, "Well, we cannot interfere." You are already in the midst of it. You are the playground. And they have to, they really can play an enormous role in, fairness, in content. In fairness, I mean, Twitter has closed down hundreds of thousands of accounts, and Facebook has thousands of people now working in part either to get rid of fake news or Russian trolls or, I mean, so. But it's this level as opposed to the, the thing you need before you get to the fruit. Yeah. It's like they're taking the, well, the poisonous okay, fruit, so but you, not the tree. Okay, but you, you raise a very tricky point, which Josh had to deal with a lot with when he was in government, and which is that. Okay, so Anwar al -Awlaki. he made you know, yeah. hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of hours of speeches. Probably 90% of them are pretty anodyne, but 10% were all about jihad or so. Uh, A, you know, would you really want to take down Anwar al -Awlaki's speeches? Really, could you do that anyway? Um, is that the solution? Uh, because it's a slippery slope, you say, you know, I mean, it, it's what form of speech is, is you know, because for the, for the social media companies, it's things that are against their terms of use, which is we, anybody who encourages violence can't be on the site, whether you're a neo-Nazi or some other yeah. flavor of extremist or whatever. So, but you seem to be advocating something slightly different, which is like uh, even people, because talking about jihad is not necessarily, uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can talk about jihad without it necessarily inciting people to violence potentially, right? I mean, it depends. It depends, that's right. So, so Josh. It's all in the translation <laughs> or... Yeah. So, my overall take, first of all, is to start from the same place as Nadia, that what happens in the virtual space is tremendously yeah. important, both in terms of its reach. Uh, terrorist entry into the United States seems to me to happen, as your study reflects, not physically, uh, thankfully, uh, terribly often, so much as virtually. They enter uh, every day, every hour um, through the wires. but. Uh, also because of its persistence, because even as territory um, gets um, taken back from groups like ISIS, it says figures get eliminated, that, that virtual component um, persists. It's not unrelated to events in the real world, but it persists. So I, I start from the same place, that it's um, a, a, a very um, serious aspect of this continuing problem. I think um, uh, the tech companies have done some serious work to do more in this space, and they still have some serious work to do. 
uh, from my perspective. Uh, in December, they announced that they would share MD5 hashes or digital uh, signatures uh, uh, among four big companies of particular pieces of content that anyone deemed to violate its terms of service on these grounds uh, so that other companies could assess whether it also violated their terms of service. Mm. And there was a sense that's how far the companies were willing to go. Particular pieces of content, the signature will get shared. Then more bad things happened and earlier this year they announced, well, those same companies will share the tools. So the way that they are finding those pieces of content, will share the tools with each other too. But again, I think there was a sense of that's how far we're willing to go. It's not clear to me that that's going to be where this ends. One could imagine other things these companies could do that would go further. One could imagine them sharing not just the piece of content, but information associated with the account that posted that content on the idea that another company might wonder whether it had accounts with similar identifying information that had content that violated their terms of service. There are reasons the companies haven't gone that, gone that far, and I'm, I understand those reasons. It's not clear to me that the lines now will hold forever. It's also not clear to me that putting aside how the companies relate to each other, how the companies relate to the government will remain where it is now, which is largely um, to see this as work that they do enforcing their own terms of service. Uh, and um, with a reluctance to and, and share. Yeah. When you say government, I mean there are governments here because the German government may take a very different line than the American government on this issue, right? That's right, and there are other governments that have themselves oriented differently towards these companies. So um, the, the first IRU, Internet Referral Unit, uh, was stood up by the UK, the CTIRU, and uh, the Brits have full-time government employees identifying content and sharing it with the companies uh, relevant to that content, saying, we think this violates your terms of service. Mm. And as I understand it, um, they are often, the Brits, often not always right. But of course, it's, it's um, even though there are different laws in the UK, um, thus far the CTRU has operated largely, if not exclusively, on a non-enforced non, um, basis, purely mm. voluntary. And when they get back an answer that says, thanks for sharing that one, but actually we're fine with that one, as I understand it, there's a dialogue and something, uh, mm -hmm. some learning on both sides to come out of that. So now there's an EU IRU. There are a couple other European countries standing up their own. We have a different system of laws and a different culture that have made some reluctant to go in that route. On the other hand, there seems to be an effectiveness uh, in what that allows between companies and government as a way of relating to each other on, uh, on these issues. Now, I also think it's interesting to compare the speed at which the companies have moved in the wake of Charlottesville mm. on some of the issues flowing from that to the speed of some of these developments when it relates to ISIS and, uh, and other groups like it. Um, and in, in fairness, uh, I thought there was some very interesting writing done by the CEO of Cloudflare, Matthew Prince, who's a very interesting guy, he thinks very hard about these issues. He wrote, I think, a blog post and then a Wall Street Journal op-ed in which he said, well, we moved pretty quickly, we at Cloudflare on this, and now I'm beginning to worry if we were right. And that's um, interesting. I, 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 I don't just, share just, all. Just yeah. for clarity, so after Charlottesville, the social media companies move pretty quickly against neo-Nazi platforms and right. neo-Nazi material on their platforms. That's right. So that if you're Cloudflare, you're not offering uh, the content delivery service, which is sort of protection uh, for a site that you would otherwise offer. There were entities related to financial transactions online that moved quickly. And uh, this sort of content stuff, looking for this content and uh, to the extent it's deemed to violate terms of service, taking it down. And that I think has to do with sort of domestic politics and what strikes me as the absolutely right denunciation of those groups. But it is interesting to note the, the differing speed at which that occurred mm -hmm. from some of the developments on the ISIS. And one other point to make on, on the tech side is I think the companies have spent a lot of time in particular on ISIS material. Al Qaeda in Syria, their material looks a lot more increasingly like ISIS's material in its slickness and savviness than Al Qaeda senior leadership, where every so often Ayman al Zawahiri pops up with a video that looks like it could have been 16 years ago of him <laughs> sitting and droning on for a while. And that's not where Al Qaeda in Syria is. And I don't think the companies have um, moved as quickly on that and in, uh, other developments in the space as they might move in, in coming months and years. David. Right, like he, he used to. 40 minutes to 25 minutes. No, no, like he's, he's, he's releasing five minute videos now. It's like it's obvious that he has an editor, um, <laughs> which, is, which is a new development um, for Al Qaeda. Uh, I think the tech company's involvement is, is um, extremely important. Um, and Peter, I worked on the same um, jigsaw project that you mentioned that Nadia had worked mm. on. 
It actually has been made public. Um, so, yeah, it was it, what they did was was fairly clever. Um, it was uh, using ad space in YouTube when someone's on YouTube and they ran two different tests of this, where uh, they call it the redirect method. When someone uh, was searching for pro ISIS material, this ad would come up. They'd use their ad space. And um, it was a very ISIS feeling ad. If you're familiar with ISIS's propaganda, it has a certain cinematic feel. And it would end with something like, learn the truth about the caliphate. And if you click through, it took you to a playlist. And Nadia and I both did research for videos that were used in these playlists in both English and Arabic. Um, it would take you to a playlist where the videos appeared to be very neutral, but actually gave people a, a different perspective on, on ISIS. And to me, um, it was a clever way to do this, but the main reason why I think it was important is it showed, you know, there's internal struggles within these companies, which are enormous creatures, about how involved they should be. Mm. And I think this showed Google that they could be involved and the world wouldn't hate them and would actually see this in a positive light. They got very good press for that. Um, I think having tech companies involved is important because there's so many different creative things that they're able to do when they have use of the platform. Uh, now in the longer term, the I, I think the, one of the most important trends in this area is going to be something that Nadia touched on. Um, there's a piece I wrote earlier this year in uh, Foreign Affairs called The Coming Islamic Culture War. And actually, I've known Nadia um, since December of 2014, we actually met at a New America event uh, mm -hmm. where she yelled at me because she thought I was too uh, soft on Al Qaeda and we've been good friends ever since. That is <laughs> actually exactly what happened. Um, but she was you know, the first person um, in the field I'm in to, to see the same trend which I'm seeing, which is you have this burgeoning debate which I've described as the most foreseeable black swan event possible. Um, about Islamic identity in Muslim majority countries. And it's actually, to me, inherent to the logic of online communication. So if you look back to the 1990s, um, I'm, you know, as a social scientist, I'm a skeptic of social science. <laughs> but if you look back to the 1990s, work being done on computer-mediated communication could not have been more on point about the impact it would have. Um, the studies on what's called identity demarginalization have you know, correctly anticipated so much of what came later. And what they found was that when people communicated in the online space um, and were able to express identities that are both marginalized and also concealable, that they would express them more in the offline space. So by concealable, I mean if you're an ethnic minority or if you have a physical handicap, if you're overweight, someone can see that by looking at you. If you are gay, if you're a neo-Nazi, if you're a jihadist, if you're all three, someone can't necessarily tell by looking at you, right? And the reason I point to those is that that's what, other than jihadism, that's what the early studies were done on. If you, you look at, you know, we're talking about, we're referring to neo-Nazis, and obviously, look, there's been a resurgence in the overt nature of this movement, which is fundamentally related to the online space. And what social scientists were finding in the 1990s was that people who could communicate online, find people who believed as they did, find these online communities, if they're neo-Nazis, would be more willing to make it a part of their lives. They found the same thing for LGBT identity. And actually, we've had a very quick revolution in the United States in LGBT rights. Right, 1996, a Democratic president passed into law the Defense of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. 2008, running for president, Barack Obama said that he defined marriage as uh, a union between one man and one woman. Then by 2016, not only would it be unthinkable in the future that a Democratic candidate would be anti-gay marriage, but Trump, whatever else you might say about him, was the most pro-LGBT Republican nominee that we've had, like without question. And so you've had this reversal much faster than like the previous civil rights movement, and that's related to how fast things move in the online space. Same thing for jihadism, identity mm. demarginalization marginalization applies. But now what Nadia is talking about is a broader debate, and it's going to happen. It's already happening. And, um, but it's, it's going to, ha when I say it's going to happen, I mean it's going to happen in a way that people will recognize it as a strategic issue and they're not there yet. Yeah. Right now, I see it, Nadia sees it, and a friend, Abdul Basit Kasim, who's a scholar at Rice, and um, he was, he's Nigerian. He just went back to the region and he actually wrote a very long Facebook post talking about how he read my piece 
didn't believe it, and then went back to the region, and it's clearly happening. Okay, just, it, just so yeah. everybody understands, what is the it oh, no, that no, we're talking I about? Just <laughs> about to explain that, because I realized <laughs> I hadn't. It was, okay. a, it was one of those things where there's a big yeah. reveal at the end. <laughs> where these different, so the different voices, atheist voices, you know, extreme secularist voices, voices that have a different view of Islamic identity are coming to the fore. And in our own society, that's happened, right? If you go back 100 years ago, it would be very typical to refer to uh, the West as the Christian world. If you see someone calling the West the Christian world today, you'll either think they're like a member of the alt-right or else just <laughs> probably very old. <laughs> um, whereas we, you know, uh, we refer to Muslim-majority countries as the Muslim world, we take you know, some level of, of Islamic identity for granted coming out of those societies. And below the surface, there are people who are not happy with that. There is going to be a debate about identity, and that's the logic of the online space. Mm. Atheist views, anti-religious views, extreme secularist views, all of these are marginalized and concealable, and the online space brings them out. And actually, we can start to see some of the leading edge of this, for example, in Bangladesh. Mm. Where if you look at who Al-Qaeda was targeting, yeah. um, it w it's atheist bloggers, LGBT bloggers, um, and you know, the more time I engage in the online space and in the region, I see that this is, it's clearly already there. It's already recognized, but it hasn't risen to the level yet where we think of it as a big issue. And one of the reasons why Nadia mentioned that sometimes these secularist accounts get pulled down is because I think we have this very narrow frame of reference for them. Right? What's happening is a debate about identity in these societies. As we see them. Right, well, and so it's put in the yeah. Islamophobia box, whereas yeah. a better exactly. box to put it in is a debate about identity. Yeah. So Bertrand Russell's book, Why I Am Not a Christian, mm -hmm. right? There's, I'm certain there's many people in here who are devout Christians. Probably none of them think that this is a book that should be censored or that is deeply offensive to them. It's a debate about what our religious identity is within Western society. Um, you know, Ibn, uh, Ibn Warak, uh, an atheist polemicist, wrote a book, Why I'm Not a Muslim, and you know, it's, uh, that's very edgy. And well, so but David, this, is is a, a this still raises a good question because, I mean, you mentioned it, the, the blasphemy thing in Pakistan. I mean, you know, to even be seen as defending somebody who might possibly have blasphemed somebody is a potential death sentence in Pakistan, as we saw with the interior minister. To, in Islam, apostasy is like much worse than anything else because you're leaving the religion. So, and, it, you're, you know, and it comes with the potential death penalty. So the cost of having this discussion in certain countries are enormously high, and, and how do you, and by the way, they're often happening in countries where public opinion is very hard to gauge. Um, so how your, your assertion that this is happening, I don't disbelieve it, but let's unpack that, and then what are the risks of having this discussion in a lot of these countries? But the thing is, the nuance that the West needs to understand, because the West is part of this, whether it wants to be or not, is that mm. as long as there are blasphemy laws, you don't even dream about countering terrorism. Because the very people who can take on these violent ideas from within, people who know the Quran by heart, people who went to school all their lives in the Middle East, people are people who would be blasted as, as blasphemous. Mm. So there is no countering terrorism without freedom. But just to of push back on that for a minute, Nadia, I mean, Please. we are not, the United States government, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Josh, is not in the business of telling the Pakistani government or the Saudi government, there are some laws on your books that we just, we just don't no, like. No, but you <laughs> control this, the, the virtual space. That's the, the most important space because that space is actually what's fueling this debate. Oh, okay, well explain more. What do you mean? So, how so would this work? When, uh, how this is, let me just say something, that this is not actually very theoretical debate in the Arab world. Most of the personal status laws in most of the Arab countries uh, is based on Sharia. Ah. So the reason why I have practically no agency in Jordan is because of Sharia. So it's not something like, oh, you know, it's a theological issue. It is very much governing my everyday life, me and millions and millions of others, which is why reform of Islamic thought is a very important, it's a legal issue. These people are changing for, fighting for civil laws, are, changing, are fighting for human rights, for the, you mentioned in your paper governance, that is such an enormous issue. We have a massive governance problem. In fact, you could argue that the governance problem is the major seed mm. for all of this. Yeah. So the online space is allowing people who are educated, who want to see essentially liberal values that govern the United States in the Middle East, where they can be free. Why should we have to migrate to have freedom? People are risking their lives to leave. Why 
Why is it unlivable? Because it's very authoritarian, because it's very violent. Because violence is seen, especially religious violence, as holy in one way or another. So these people are using the online, what I, uh, the liberal people who espouse liberal values. The only space they have to educate in liberal values, educate in secularism, is the virtual space. Mm. And we need to hold that sacred. As, as David mentioned, uh, when there's an edgy book that, I don't know, somebody in, let me mention that most of the content is in Arabic, not in English. So you can imagine companies, American companies in Silicon Valley having to deal with an enormous amount of text in Arabic, and you get a lot of complaints from conservative Muslims that this is offending me because it's preaching secularism and I would like Sharia Allah. So, so it, this so is- So what are you recommending? I recommend that American companies become defender of these secular voices because what they want is separation of religion and state. They do not want to deprive people of being Muslim or Christian or Shia. They want separation where the state or some cleric do not have the right to kill you or force on you a version you don't want to believe. Josh. I was just going to say that, that Nadia's um, thoughts go to the point, the question you asked earlier, which I'm not sure I, I gave you a, a satisfactory answer on of what does it mean, whether it's for a tech company or the US government, to do better at, at, mm. at this stuff? And I think that actually goes back to how you use the technology to try to be not just a source of challenge, but also a, a source of, um, uh, of trying to mitigate that challenge. So the, the fundamental philosophical reorientation that the Global Engagement Center was meant to instantiate was to acknowledge, probably uh, later than it should have been, that uh, the U.S. government is not going to be a good messenger for conveying any of the issues that, that, that um, Nadia uh, is flagging. If, if so, only rarely and only for certain limited audiences. And instead, to figure out how to empower voices that did offer credible messages without tainting those voices, which is the worst result in the world, is part of the challenge. It's a challenge that companies, to their credit, are also grappling with as they try to offer training sessions and try to figure out how to lift up those voices. But in some ways, the, the reason that technology seems maybe more on the challenge ledger right now is ISIS got to this quickly and built a, a sort of virtual community um, that people feel at least connected to. Mm. It, it strikes me, and I, I've said in, in writings, uh, that it's a false sense of connection. But they don't feel like lone wolves. They feel uh, not alone at all. They, they feel like they are part of something bigger, and they have something to plug into. And how to elevate voices offering a different vision, especially to those who are so vulnerable that ISIS and others' messages are compelling, um, that seems to me where you go to make things better. Kelly? So uh, in terms of your question as to how do I know this is happening with respect to this identity debate, uh, I'd say you know, in addition to observational evidence, it's just the logic of the online space, mm. that it brings out that which is marginalized. And um, I agree with you about the targeting of secularists or atheists, apostates. Um, but as, as we know, from the past 16 years, it's hard to kill an idea. Mm. Um, in terms of what the government should do, that's much, much more difficult. But to me, one of the main things in this area is I just think knowing what's coming is important mm. because I think it's obvious that this is coming and, with, and it's going to have profound impact. We can already see it at a level of who jihadists are targeting, but it, it is going to have an impact within the region and I think thinking it through is part of anticipating the way that the strategic environment is going to evolve. So that's a kind of optimistic way to begin the question and answer session. Absolutely. Okay. So if you have a question, can you wait for the mic and identify yourself? We'll take the lady in the back first. The lady behind you, uh, Albert. Hi, Cynthia Schneider from Georgetown University. I want to just delve a little deeper into the kind of topics that Nadia's talking about, you know, and particularly with technology in the virtual space. You know, what, what Google has been doing, it, as I understand it, is, is targeting individuals who are susceptible and trying to turn them, literally one by one. But then there's the whole gray space that you were talking about, Nadia, for the war of ideas. Of what, so I'm curious to know more about what kinds of information, what kinds of voices you feel need to be leveraged more in that gray space a, an example, and I'm working on with my Timbuktu Renaissance project in Mali and working specifically in Timbuktu, Northern Mali, which you mentioned, working with the Google Cultural Institute, 
is to provide translations and explanations of the content of the Timbuktu manuscripts, mm. which could have been written in 15th century Florence. It's all about humanism. So mm. I'm curious about the content and the voices that you think should get out, and is there who should be doing that? Who can do that and how? So, uh, great question. The good, the good uh, thing is that there's actually a plethora. So, <laughs> as I'm researching my book, I was actually going to, uh, I saw that there's, if you look at education, there's all sorts of uh, thought entrepreneurs, if you would. Like, for example, uh, one young man, uh, an, a Jordanian living in Dubai, was watching his kids watching children's stories on TV, and saw the, the very intolerant, almost fascist ideas that we are superior because we're Muslim and non-Muslims are practically non-human. and So all these ideas that he was not comfortable, even though they're not directly violent, it's that gray area that actually is inevitably makes it very easy for you to get to the next stage, but you have to go through it. So he quit his job and started this platform, uh, uh, Children's Stories. In beautiful Arabic, he hired top linguists and top uh, uh, vocal uh, actors to, for, for these stories, which basically aim at uh, instilling in children curiosity about the other, as opposed to animosity, uh, uh, about the world in general, tolerance, uh, diversity, confidence in yourself, individualism, these, these values that he, would be, he believes that his kids need for the 21st century. Uh, so his product now gets a million downloads with zero advertising. So there's also there's in education, in journalism, in music, in film, in short films. There's actually a plethora of talent because people who live in the Middle East, enough of them, enough brilliant people realize it's either us or ISIS. And you know what? Arab states, they really see it. They really see that there's no gray area because Arab states are much more comfortable with extremists who allow them to continue to rule than with liberal voices that ultimately mean they have to leave. We have to have real, for the first time in our history, have to have actual democratic governments that allow for freedom. We have never experienced that yet. So they're much more comfortable with Islamist voices than liberal voices, which is why you can tweet one sentence that is pro-human rights and be out, you know, jailed or killed. Or so there's a plethora of them. So who is to decide? I think if there is an intention, if there is really an intention and recognition that in order to really counter the ideology, you need to populate the virtual space where people go for knowledge with these kind of material that furthers real tolerance and nonviolence, <coughs> et cetera. You can have a committee, and I think it would not be very hard to, to identify who can, because who can, there's so much. But if, if there's intention, if there's a will, there's a way, right? Gentleman in front here. I'm, uh, I'm an attorney and a, a veteran of the Army, and 16 years ago, my sister had just left a job in the North Tower, and no one she worked with survived. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, particularly touched by what went down on 9-11, and I've tried to understand it, and I've done a lot of work since then um, on the counterterrorism problem. Thinking about people and plots, I wonder each of you, if you if you discuss a little bit as a panel what you think it says about the counterterrorism effort that we can't find either Baghdadi or Zawahiri. And here we are 16 years into this, and we don't know where the leaders of the organizations that we're fighting even are. And then secondly, I think that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS are looking at WMD. And they they have it on a long time frame, but I'm concerned that if John Brennan indeed thinks that this is a 100-year war that we're embarked on, that time is on the jihadi side. And Peter was very on the money over, over time, saying that the threat was really a low-grade, non-existential threat, particularly focused on aviation. Everything's borne out Peter's prognosis thus far. Everyone missed the rise of ISIS. However, I do feel that Zawahiri in particular pays heed to bin Laden's dictum 
that he will be patient until patience is outworn by patience. And I feel now with Hamza coming to the fore that there is a second or even a third generation of Al-Qaeda that are more professional, better networked, more experienced, more dug into these societies like Mali and Pakistan. And I wonder, A, does it matter that we can't find bin Laden's successor, Zawahiri? Does it matter that we can't even tell if Baghdadi is dead or alive? And third, and most importantly, what do you think of WMD? Is it on their menu, and, and will we see it? Thanks. So in the paper that New America published today, we have a very comp quite a comprehensive answer to the WMD question, the weapons of mass destruction. You know, in all the jihadi terrorist plots in the West, one thing is quite striking. None of them involves weapons of mass destruction. They were even attempted, and it's a weapon of mass destruction, a misnomer, right? There's only one weapon of mass destruction, really. It's a nuclear uh, a bomb. But radiological bombs, chemical bombs, biological bombs. And so in the 413 cases since 9-11 of jihadi terrorism in the United States, not one of the people involved tried to use these kinds of weapons, tried to get precursors. So it's sort of a non-issue, which doesn't mean that it couldn't become an issue. Now, in this country, 13 people motivated by extreme right-wing ideology, uh, some with idiosyncratic motives, have experimented with these weapons in a pretty kind of low-level way. These weapons are very hard to, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein had unlimited amounts of money uh, in his search for weapons of mass destruction and never really got to the, what he wanted, which is a nuclear weapon. So these are complicated things to acquire. Now, the, there's, there's a few caveats, and, and, but one, one more point. When ISIS took Mosul, as we know from Joby Warwick's reporting, they had Cobalt 60 in their, you know, that uh, they'd taken labs at Mosul University that had Cobalt 60. They did nothing with it. They had no idea what it was, because, uh, you know, uh, but Cobalt 60 would have been useful for radiological weapons. Now, ISIS has, you know, and Al Qaeda before it in Iraq to deploy crude chlorine weapons, but when you blow up a chlorine bomb, people die from the blast, not the chlorine. I mean, it's a very inefficient way to kill people. Uh, so, Hitherto, uh, most of these groups have not really gone down that route. It's much easier to both kill somebody with a bomb or shoot them or whatever. Now, the big caveat to this, I think, is bioterrorism. And uh, the big caveat, it, it comes in two, two flavors. First of all, it was Bruce Ivins, who had very idiosyncratic motives, who killed five people shortly after 9-11. He was a microbiologist at a very senior level in the U.S. government. Now, to me, the issue is not terrorists but trying to become kill microbiologists, it's microbiologists adopting jihadist ideas or any other kind of extreme idea because, you know, and there's a more law in biology where things are becoming easier to do. Uh, and so that, I think, is a reasonable concern. And you could imagine an Indonesian microbiologist who suddenly thinks the ideas of Jamal Islamia are the right ones. Well, that is a big problem. And the secondary problem is gene editing. And I'm not a scientist, as you will, as my comments will quickly uh, show. But gene editing takes us into a whole new world. Uh, a lot of good things, but like any technological development, a lot of bad things. Could you imagine, for instance, a virus that attacked people with distinctly Jewish heritage or distinctly Irish heritage or choose your flavor? Uh, this is a kind of dystopian future uh, that uh, is not, I think, entirely impossible. But I think for the moment, uh, we, we don't have to concern ourselves too much with it. And one, just on the, and I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the panel, but you know, we tend to overthink particular people. Um, it turns out we over, kind of overthunk bin Laden. Bin Laden's ideas uh, of survive his, his death. Anwar al 77 people in this country after the death of Anwar al were found to have Anwar al um, you know, videos in their possession at the time of their arrest. So killing ideas, as we've all agreed, is hard. Killing people is, can be tricky. I mean, Ayman al-Zawari has managed to survive. Uh, and you could make the argument, great. I mean, if you were to select the, wor the worst person in the world to run al-Qaeda, you would find somebody like Ayman al-Zawari, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, charisma-free uh, bore uh, who, you know, is disliked by people within his own organization. So, you know, from a real politic thing, great. I mean, Ayman al has continued to run Al-Qaeda Central into the ground. So, but I, you know, we get too hung up on that. Um, I mean, if Bag Baghdadi died tomorrow, clearly they thought this one through. And they, so, uh, Josh, you had to deal with this to the extent that you can talk about it publicly. 
uh, what can you say? Let, let me say maybe a word on, on yeah. just on, on yeah. the, the WMV uh, issue. Th this stri strikes me as, as um, one of the reasons why addressing safe havens held by terrorists remains important. I, in the yeah. you can never please everyone category, there's been <laughs> over the past couple of months some commentary of, well, how much did it matter that ISIS held Mosul or Raqqa or wherever anyway? You know, it, well, it seems to me it matters for various reasons, um, including some of the messaging that is more credible if you have territory to hold uh, and point to. But another is because WMD work doesn't necessarily take a certain amount of space, but it sure is easier if you're insulated from law enforcement, uh, intelligence collection, et cetera. So um, uh, as a problem that I admit seems not, thankfully, to have been um, acted on in any, uh, in, in any of the plots you mentioned, Peter. Did but you say that the university of Mosul became a locus of ISIS expertise in both bio and chem, and you just saw in Sydney, for example, with the swamp gas plot, that this expertise had migrated from Syria? But I, yeah, I think the so point about Joby's reporting on the issue is they didn't, if, if it became a locus of expertise, their expertise was not very big because right in the University of Mosul, they had materials they could have deployed which they didn't use. But, but it's still quite worrisome when they yeah. have a University of Mosul as right. in <laughs> right. that controlled area. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with that. The yeah. other, on the other front, individuals, I, I tend to be where, where Peter is in part, and this goes back to our discussion of the, the, uh, the role of the virtual world. There's a leadership capacity organizationally that especially ISIS with all of its planning, I suspect has figured out a succession strategy, hopefully with um, less talented folks so far as I'm <laughs> concerned, but uh, I'm yeah. sure they've thought it through. Then there's the kind of inspirational element to leadership. And uh, I, I'm all for decapitating the leadership of, of terrorist groups. I think that's part of, it's not sufficient, but part of a thorough approach to counterterrorism. But when those voices do live on, to the extent that the inspirational piece is about how they articulate a message and something distinctive about the way they speak to that message and are able to galvanize perhaps a very small part of the global population to act on it, but still a worrisome part, um, when you do have al laki still inspiring, Bin Laden himself still inspiring, it doesn't go away when, when the person goes away. Nadia? Uh, you know, psychologically, there are some people in the Middle East who have heard these stories, like if they really wanted to kill them, they would kill them. It's America, they put a man on the moon, right? So why can't they do this? So hmm. are they in some shape or form complacent in this? But at the same time, from the U.S. perspective, again, like to invest so much resources in killing one person when that one person may or may not have an impact, especially when the, the, the big inspirations death didn't make an impact. So I'm with Peter on this. And by the way, just as a side note, I mean, just to pick up on something Josh said, I mean, according to General Raymond Tony Thomas, who's the head of Special Operations Command, who spoke publicly in July, we, we the United States-led coalition, have killed 60,000 to 70,000 ISIS fighters. So it's not like we just, you know, I mean, when you're taking out that a number of people, I think the UN, we quote this figure in the, the paper we just published, UN now uh, last month uh, estimated there was maybe 12,000 to 20,000 ISIS fighters left. My guess is the 12,000 is a much more accurate. And you know, the foreign fighters that we're concerned about, many of them are dying in place, according to, there was a lot of concern that they would come back. Yes, some did come back to, to the West, but the ones that are staying, you know, either they're volunteering to die or they're just dying because they're being killed, the V. I would just add that one of the enduring lessons of the past 16 years is the difficulty of finding and killing an individual person who has good operational security. David, do you have a question? Or you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank David. you. Um, David Sturman here at New America. I want to take the conversation back a little bit to the question of state support and ask about what I think are two highly unlikely routes to an end to the current jihadist terrorist threat, but ones that I'd like to get your sense of, is there a possible route, regardless of likelihood, and some sense of how likely you would see that. And those two are um, that Al-Qaeda and other jihadist groups continually see their efforts to take over territory, getting smashed, and instead retreat to local terrorism and not attacking the far enemy. And the second is that um, Gulf states or other states in the region via funding various ecosystems 
actually succeed in taking over um, the radical groups and forcing them to increasingly have to kowtow to um, their demands that may or may not be within the international system. And I think everyone here agrees those are quite unlikely compared to the eight drivers of the jihadist threat, but do you think those are possible conditions, especially given that in some of its propaganda, this seems to be the ISIS claim about why Al-Qaeda is not a legitimate um, conveyor of jihadist ideology or jihadist politics in the future? We'll go down the road. So <laughs> I dare say that most Arab states are not interested in uprooting the tree, but just taking the poisonous uh, fruits when convenient. Because it's, it's, it used to be that the governments, look at the Arab world a few decades ago. Look at TV a few decades ago. There is, you know, women are very Western looking. It was a very liberal place. Cinema in Cairo, a very different place. And then you see the rise of Islamism with government blessing. And the choice was us or the Islamists, what would you like? And of course, people would rather vote for secular state than Islamists until they became so authoritarian that people said, you know what, we'll take the Islamists. You're unbearable. So now the choice is us or ISIS, what would you like? So ISIS is actually important, or, or its sisters, as we say in Arabic. So ISIS under any name, whether it's Al-Qaeda, Fatah Islam, et cetera, so the choice that the Arab states, many of them like, is us or them. So what would you like? They don't want an actual liberal voice, an actual viable democratic competition. That is way worse scenario than actually dealing with terrorists that they basically can fund. They have the, you know, almost a remote control, cut funding, allow a little bit. You know, it's, they're, they're totally in charge because they're in charge of liberal voices down to a tweet, to a sentence as opposed to opening the borders for thousands to pour into Syria or, so until in the West, there is, again, really understanding and appreciation for soft power, for authentic local soft power, because it's the only power that can really root fresh, you know, very liberal values in, that, in the Middle East. I don't see this is going anywhere, and I don't see states becoming part of the right part of history in the Arab world. So as you were walking through those two scenarios, I was reminded of that line from the X-Files, I want to believe. And I, I would love to see those things come, <laughs> come true. I, I, I share a sort of skepticism uh, uh, that that's the way it, it plays out. Nadia spoke pretty well to the second scenario. So maybe just to say a word or two on, on the first scenario. Um, part of what's challenging about the ideological component of taking on what is itself an ideolo ideologically driven phenomenon is that it's non-falsifiable, right? These, the, what's been <laughs> cultivated, first by Al-Qaeda, now by ISIS, it's able to integrate into its message, but I think it's a, in some ways a sincerely believed message, whatever happens. So if you hold territory, that's a sign of, of victory and things to come. Mm -hmm. If you lose territory, well, that's a sign that you're in one of those periods where you need to regroup and you'll come back stronger. And the, 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 the message is able to incorporate world events with more or less credibility in that matters and, and still sort of forge ahead. And so the idea that, um, that a group that has sort of tasted the, the big screen as much as ISIS or Al-Qaeda would voluntarily resort to, to um, pursuing only more local grievances, um, I think it would be useful for that to happen. And we do see affiliates or um, splinter groups pop off. So it's not really a yes or no question, but big picture, it would seem to me difficult for them to either believe or make the deliberate recruitment strategy of trying to get new folks to sign on to something that sounds less exciting and less <laughs> ambitious. That's a, sort of a hard, a hard sell. So that, that's my inclination, though I wish it were, uh, I wish either of those scenarios were to unfold and, and the quicker the better. David, the final word for you. Um, so the final word is, uh, I actually agree with um, both Nadia and Josh. Uh, I'd actually be very interested in seeing a rigorous take on under what conditions a jihadist group is purely local. Because this debate comes up a lot, that this group is local, they're not actually transnational. It's almost never true when it's said, though, in the sense that um, we can see 
the flow of foreign fighters, uh, the flow of technical assistance across groups, and almost always that exists, even in groups that are you know, really described in the literature almost um, always as being nationalist in outlook, like the East Turkestan Islamic Movement slash Turkestan Islamic Party, which is the Uyghur group. Like if you look at their rhetoric, it's very standard AQ rhetoric, plus they're in battlefields like Syria and Afghanistan. So the idea that they're just purely local, I don't think is borne out by the evidence. It would be really interesting to see, but the trend is definitely against pure localization because both of the interconnected world that we live in, where it's just easier to be transnational, and B, by the fact that you have so many jihadist victories across so many different areas, that these groups benefit by being interconnected. And then C, based on the fact that their ideology is inherently a transnational ideology, it tends to make um, local uh, groups the exception rather than the norm. Although, of course, every group does have some local aspirations. It's, I, I don't think you'd find any that is only transnational and has no local focus. Peter, I, I really want to um, thank you for inviting us to be here. Oh, so thank you. Great uh, discussion. Thanks for the <laughs> and thanks, thanks for coming, and thank you to the C-SPAN uh, production team, and uh, it was really a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you.